Handel was now entering middle age and beginning to put on weight. He composed with a seemingly inexhaustible energy, and his work would have undoubtedly made him rich if he hadn't continuously put all the cash into the opera company. He was by then a Londoner. He was a person that people recognised and was a visible public figure. There's a sort of parody of Handel with a heavy German accent. Now, I don't quite believe that. I think he had a forceful way, a rather heavy way of speaking English. It was said he could swear in four or five tongues, as it were. He could manage Latin and, and English and German and French, as well as Italian. His public profile made him the butt of numerous jokes. Cartoonists depicted him as a greedy, selfish brute, literally a pig in a wig. But it wasn't just the man himself, it was his entire artistic project that was fair game. And the greatest satirist of them all, William Hogarth, launched his career with an etching that lampooned Handel's Italian opera. Uh, this is the print I, I want to show you to start with. Uh, this is um, the one that Hogarth referred to as the bad taste of the town. And on the left here, we have the building in which Handel's Italian operas were put on that. And this show cloth here shows a scene from an Italian opera. And we have here this central figure, the leading Italian diva of the day, Madame Cuzzoni. She's got two Roman guards either side of her. It's probably Giulio Cesare. And we can see... This nobleman here, he's got this little bubble which says, pray accept 8,000 pounds. That's about a million in today's money. And um, he's pouring out a sack of gold coins in front of her. And um, we can see that Madame Cuzzoni is holding a rake. So she is literally raking it in. <laughs> the worst was to come. A new musical sensation was about to deliver a fatal blow to Handel's master plan. The Beggar's Opera was something totally new, a caustic musical satire that ripped into the corruption at the heart of 18th century society. It was constructed out of 70 already well-known songs, street music, folk tunes and works by Purcell and Handel, all given savage and witty new lyrics by Handel's former collaborator from Canons, John Gay. Instead of employing well-known professional singers, Gay assembled a cast of energetic young actors who sang like the man in the street. To London audiences, the Beggar's Opera must have sounded like something totally radical and modern. By taking a contemporary approach to the music, I hope to capture some of the impact the work must originally have had when it really was the shock of the new. So calm and have grown That a true friend Can hardly be met Friendship or interest Is but a loan Which they let out For what they can get To show you find Some friends so kind Who give you good counsel Themselves to defend In sorrow or pity They promise they did Ship you money from friend to friend. John Gay's English lyrics spoke directly to the audience in a way that Handel's Italian operas never could. He peopled the stage not with kings and queens and gods and goddesses, but with real London lowlife. The highwayman Macheath and assorted pickpockets and prostitutes. Gay's subject was the theft of innocence in a corrupt world. Virgins are like the fair flowers. It starts off with her talking about the fair flowers and how wonderful this is, but how, like, as soon as they're plucked, that their worth is just completely lost and they end up, you know, on the scrap heap, basically, but which kind of in those days, that's how it was. That was the harsh reality of it. 
This song seethes with all of Gay's moral outrage at the exploitation of the weak by the rich and powerful. He hammers it home when the villainous McHeath is reprieved from execution at the last moment in a ludicrous send-up of the conventional happy ending of an Italian opera. To the tune of Greensleeves, McHeath claims that thanks to their money, the upper classes always get away with their crimes. Since laws were made from every degree He took curb vice in others as well as me I wonder we had better company Upon Tyburn Tree The popular success of the Beggar's Opera was simply staggering. It was performed in London every season for the next 100 years. It was genuinely something new. I'd call it the first British musical. And it was a success that hit Handel where it hurt him most, at the box office. In the 1730s, there were problems. People said, the theatre's going to be a bit empty tonight. And Handel said, well, the music will sound better. Uh, with fewer people in the audience, there'll be a, a bit more resonance in there. It was obviously a, a very personal matter. He actually signs a letter which is published in the papers saying, I have done my best for the London audience, but find they're not turning up. Finally, the spiralling financial difficulties bankrupted his opera company. And after 25 years in Britain, Handel's cherished dream was coming to an end. In 1741, Handel is finally forced to give up on opera when his new work, Dear Damia, is an ignominious failure and is taken off after just three performances. Typically, Handel got over his disappointment in crafting a new masterpiece, Messiah. Handel, devout Protestant and regular worshipper at St George's Hanover Square, Messiah was a personal expression of faith. Composed in just 24 days, it combined his love of church music with his passion for opera celebrating Jesus' significance for all humanity with a text drawn from the Bible and, crucially, in English. And this was the turning point. This is when, for me, Handel ceased to be an illustrious composer from abroad but became one of us. discovered the ideal vehicle for his musical ambitions. Messiah is an oratorio, a kind of narrative concert previously unknown in the UK. Dramatic texts could be played out in non-theatrical space, with no expensive scenery or costumes, all bound together by thrilling choruses that could be sung by pretty much every man. Through these collective experiences, Handel started a very British choral revolution. It's thanks to him that even today there are probably more choral societies per square inch in our country than in most others. We British love to sing, 
Handel saw it and harnessed it. The Hallelujah Chorus is the centrepiece of the oratorio. When George II first heard it, he spontaneously got to his feet. Because the king had stood up, everyone else had to stand, audience and musicians. Massar is without doubt Handel's masterpiece, a massive artistic success, but also just the popular success his career needed. And it was the Hallelujah Chorus that really seized the public imagination. With a little bit of rehearsal, anybody can be a part of it. And here in a school hall in Somerset, I brought the pupils together with singers from half a dozen local choral societies for a Hallelujah Chorus crash course. <laughs> 